I was waiting for Mark and Dino. Let the record show. <laughs> All right. All right, we're going to get started here this morning. If you can kindly find your seats six feet apart. For those who aren't family, we're going to get started this morning with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump in. Okie dokie. Join me in prayer as I pray aloud, please. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this space that we can meet, Father God. We thank you for, uh, for the, uh, the brotherhood of, uh, that you've given us, Father God, and your Son, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. Thank you that you redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb, Father God. Thank you, Lord, that we're uh, already seated in the heavenly places, Lord, in Christ Jesus, Father God. Thank you for the promises of your word, Lord. Those are the true riches, Father God, the, the things that are awaiting us, Lord, the heavenly promises, Father God. Help us to think on those things this morning, Lord. Help us to uh, lay aside the uh, shackles of religion, Father God. Help us to just worship you in spirit and in truth, Father God, as only we can with you, Lord. Uh, I pray, Father God, that you might just uh, be in the midst of all these things, Lord. We ask that you get the honor and the glory from it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You can join me in standing and turn to page 17. I have a verse I just want to read real quick. Uh, we're going to be singing, Come Thou Fount. I was reading this morning in Matthew chapter 11. I thought this was a blessing. I think it will be a blessing to you. Just uh, an invitation that, uh, that Jesus Christ gives us. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I just think it's an amazing thing that the God of the universe would invite us to, to come and sup with him and come and, uh, and share that yoke with him. And, you know, he, you know, his disciples, you know, when they first met him, they said, you know, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said, come and see. He's always inviting. And I think, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's truly telling that the Bible ends with a man then saying, even so, come, Lord Jesus. So let's, let's pray this prayer unto God. Let's ask him to come and be with our fellowship this morning. Let's sing, come thou fount. Let's ask him to, to, to help us out this morning, all right? Come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy great streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet song Praise the mountain. 
going to be singing another song, I don't know, some of it might be new to you guys, called Come and Dine, Come and Dine. Do you have, Danielle, may I see your paper real quick? Good. Is there four or three? There's three, right? Okay, there's three. Pat didn't tell me if there was three or four. Come and dine. Sometimes you, you know, sometimes you're like me and you, you just, you're looking for a meal anywhere. You might even go to a different state, but Jesus Christ offers you, you know, the bread of heaven anywhere you want. And uh, I think that's an amazing thing that he invites us to come and dine with him. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. With his manna he does feed and supplies our every need. Oh, this we can with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master call it, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table. Turn with me to page 95, Living by Faith. This is another, maybe a new one for some of you. People, are you? People too. I know it might not say it in the chorus, but for those of you who know it, there's a lady's part and a man's part. So if those of you who know it, sing it out, and maybe we can try to figure it out together. It's, it's really good when it comes together. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, its shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. I'm living by faith in Jesus above, trusting Tempest may blow and those storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness 
if you would. not entangled with the masks of this life. All right. Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? Oh, that was bad. That was weak. Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? All right. Half week, but I'll give it, I'll let you go on that one. I know it's warm out. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I know we have uh, some folks traveling. I know it's the summer still, almost, almost over. All right, so um, I'm a teacher, so I, I, I know it's, it's almost over. We, August is the perpetual Sunday night for us, you know, like the Sunday before you go back to school. But we'll be all right. So uh, welcome. I uh, just want to say hello to everybody. I want to say hello to um, Brian. Brian in the back. Thanks for being here, Brian. A friend of Brian's, right? We have a lot of mats. So Brian, I think, is trying to get more Brian's in the building than mats. So I don't know. But thanks for being here, man. Just sit back, relax. Uh, we just try to keep it as plain and simple and as first century New Testament Christianity as we can get. Uh, just kind of having a good time together. Um, also, we have uh, Pete. Did you want to say anything, Pete? Do you have any news to share with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. Yes, yes. That's all good. That's all good. But uh, yes. Uh, Pete always adds in that she said yes, but we wouldn't put him on the spot if she said anything else but yes. <laughs> what happened, Pete? Well, it didn't go so good. No, yeah, but that's a blessing, so praise the Lord for that. Um, Chris, Steven, Steven's birthday was, was Monday, so I have to sing for Steven or else I'm, you know, in a ton of trouble. Um, but I'm gonna, we're going to sing. Did anybody else have a birthday this week? Any other birthdays? Oh, that's right. That's right, but I thought it's the 11th. But it's this upcoming week, right? So I don't know if we're going to sing for the colognes. It's like the upcoming week. You know, it gets very complicated. You know, when do we sing? When do we sing? Do we sing when the week is past? Or do we sing in the week upcoming? I mean, these are the big decisions that we have to have meetings about and, and really get together and counsel about. We'll sing for birthdays in a little bit. Uh, but um, coming up, um, Friday we have the rescue mission. And as far as I know, I haven't heard back from Brother George there yet, but as far as I know, the same specs as last month apply, that we could bring three people for the quote-unquote ministry team, 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 team. So if you want to go, uh, please let me know. All right, so we'll try to, we'll have to keep it to just three people. Unless I hear differently from, uh, from Brother George, I'm going to go off the old specs. So if you want to go, it's, we were there, what, Eli Bryan, we were there probably 45 minutes last time. We were driving home. By like 8 o'clock, we were like on our way home. So it's a very small crowd. It's like 9 or 10 guys that are in the program there that have been relatively quarantined. And uh, we just did a Bible study, sang a couple of songs, opened the Word of God for them. 
said amen, went home. It wasn't like, you know, 40 or 50 people like it's been in the past where you're talking to a lot of people. So literally, I think we got in the car, and I think it was like 7, was it 7.45? I think it was like 7.45, 8 o'clock. I was like, we're on our way home already. What is going on? So if anybody wants to be a part of that, let me know, and we'll, the first three people, I guess, that want to do it, please let us know, and we'll see what we can sort out. Uh, also next week, again, I know we got some folks traveling. The Colleen's are traveling today. They're out of town. Others, I'm sure, but... The Lord laid this on our heart a couple of weeks ago. I think I was in Lowe's, and you know, a lot of things hit you in Lowe's. It's probably oxygen deprivation lets me start having like a, you know, like a moment of something. But I was like, you know what? We haven't been able to have like an open meeting, Lord's table, even though I found where they make little Lord's table things prepackaged, so I might go buy those and do that for all you guys that got this COVID skivats. But um, I figured, you know, we need to get some other people speaking, so... Next weekend, we're going to kind of have like a mixed meeting on Sunday. I've asked a few of our guys to bring some short messages. Um, so we're going to have a few different guys speak. I won't tell you who they are yet, but we'll have a few different guys. They know who they are. Uh, testimony here or there, a couple of short messages here or there. Don't worry, we'll still get you out on time. But uh, it's good for the body to kind of edify itself and help itself to remind you and me that it isn't about this mouth that makes this thing work or run. I mean, the Lord, this is the Lord's church, and uh, there are a lot of good guys here. I mean, it's a blessing that we have this nursing home rotation. I haven't done it in like almost two months. I mean, we've got about five guys that are producing messages every week. I mean, that's a healthy church that other people know how to open the Word of God and bring uh, good news to people that need it. And we have a room full of guys here and ladies that can navigate it as well. We've got a room full of guys that can open up the Bible and, and preach it. So we want to do that be a blessing to the church, and just kind of let people, you know, see some other voices, let some other people minister to each other. So I'm excited about it. I will be here, all right? So sometimes when pastor's gone, I know people figure I don't have to be there that Sunday. I know how it goes, but, you know, I'll be here. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to sit right down with my family, and I'm going to just enjoy, enjoy the preaching and the time together. So uh, that's going to be next week. Invite some friends. They're probably not, the guys that are going to speak are probably not as nasty as I am. So you can invite some people, and it'll be a, a beautiful time. We're also going to try at the end of this month, we think, uh, to have a baptism. Uh, we haven't worked out the details yet, but the brother John, who's the custodian here, be extra nice to him. He's a brother in Christ. He has been super awesome for us and to us. And uh, he said, look, he goes, you want to do it right outside the door there on the grass? So we, he says we could have a baptism right out there, you know, on the grass. So like last week, he's like, look, I'll work with you. It's just us here. So we want to be good. We want to kind of be respectful and be compliant, you know, with our masks out there and everything. I know some of you have very strong feelings about that. But so he, on his head, nothing falls on his head. And if anybody looks and, and anybody asks him, you know, how's that church like, you know, oh, no, they're great. They wear their masks. They're wonderful. Like that's, I want that to be our testimony. So anyway, that's that. Um, Mary, is Mary here? Do you have some visitors, Mary? Hello, Caden and Kyla. Thank you for being with us today. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us. Um, a few quick things to pray about, and then we'll sing. All right? A few quick things to pray about. Um, keep praying for Bruno. Um, I, he's not as bad as I am with a microphone. But uh, he's, you know, he's dealing with taking care of his parents and stuff, and, and pray for Nisha. We haven't seen her in a while. Uh, we did go look at a building this week, and we're praying about it. It's the Music and Art Academy right on 34, that white building right across from Strathmore. It actually is Matawan zoning, and a church building is a permitted use. So we looked at it. Um, it's still a long shot. It's still very expensive. <laughs> So my hopes are not up. I'm just like numb to everything, but we're just taking it one step at a time, reaching out to the township, seeing if we're allowed to kind of have the capacity to be in there. If the door slams shut, we'll keep looking elsewhere. We are still looking elsewhere, um, but my wife always tells me, I can't, we don't want to make an idol out of this thing. Like the Lord is always going to take care of us. I mean, Carissa, we were talking this week and she said like, I think our people are just so used to meeting anyway right now. We'd meet out in the field or the woods somewhere. And I was like, amen. I like that spirit. So... Praise the Lord. Pray for John Koch. I've been pronouncing him as John Notch for months. And then last night I sent a text out about him and he texted me back, LOL, my name is Koch, K-O-T-C-H. So I was like, why did you wait so long to tell me? But um, 
I guess it's just a notch on his belt to have something against me. Ha <laughs> ha, thank you. All right. So John Koch, he's like, like the mayor with a T. So I said, all right, John Koch. So keep praying for him. He would like to get baptized, actually. He's one of the guys that said it, and he's literally physically in pain. Uh, we went to speak to him about two weeks ago, and he could not sit. And every once in a while, he'd have to go into like a squat to stretch his back and then come out. And he's really frail. But we're praying for him and his wife, Kerry. And we went to go look at this music and art academy. We're standing there, and I'm looking at the bulletin board, and there's a picture of his wife, because his wife used to teach there, teach music. So that's funny. Uh, pray for Jessica Keem. She's back in Hawaii. Uh, pray that the decisions and the things she made here kind of stick and last. And uh, it's good to see Brother Vin. I'm going to clap for you, Brother Vin. It's good to see him. All right. Keep Brother Vin in prayer. He's got a whole bunch of physical things going on, and the Lord's, you know, getting him through it, but he's in that, you know, that, that valley. So pray for our brother. It's great to see him and uh, hold him up in your prayers. So I want to pray out loud, and uh, would you join me in audibly as I pray audibly, and then we'll, Josh will sing again, all right? Amen, amen. Father, thank you so much for your mercy, Lord. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for your grace, for your time together with you, Father. Thank you for dying on the cross, Lord. Thank you for giving us for our sins, Lord. Thank you for giving us hope and a new life. Thank you for a hope that goes beyond this mere house of clay, Lord. Thank you for a hope that goes beyond this vapor, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for every person sitting here that they might do business with you today, Father. This may not be just a religious activity, Lord, but it might be a time to sit and stare into your word and hear what you would, you would say to us. And I pray, Lord, your church would be edified. And if there is someone here lost and doesn't know you, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit, Lord, would give them understanding that they might turn to you and call upon you in spirit and in truth and be saved, as the Bible says. And I pray, Lord, for our brethren, Lord, for Brother Vin, Brother Bruno, Sister Nisha, uh, people traveling, Lord, people that have just had things happen in their lives, Lord, that has kind of just knocked them out of the ability to fellowship, Lord, our brother John Koch. Lord, I pray you just keep your hand on them. Help us, Lord, not to get caught in the tide of this life. Help us to draw nigh in full assurance of faith, Lord. Help us to redeem the time, because the days are evil. And may you, Lord Jesus, get all the glory out of us today, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to walk with you. And I pray you'd fellowship with your people today, Lord. I pray if anyone's here, Lord, I pray it would be you, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we ask you, Father. Amen. All right. Gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> Organized religion. Page 228. 228. My faith has found a resting place. You guys trying to figure out who's starting it? faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall bleed. I need no Sinful soul, I come to 
him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no died and that he died for me my great physician heals the sick the lost he amen amen for me his precious blood he shed for me his life he gave I need no died and that he died for me. Amen, amen. Thank you for singing with me. Sunday school, you are dismissed. That's better. There I am. There I am. Amen. Glory. All right. John chapter 8. I think by the millennium we'll be finished with John 8, and then we'll be ready for John 9. All right. Also, definitely, uh, probably maybe when I finish John chapter 8, I got a bunch of ideas in my head. When I finish John 8, I'm thinking maybe we're going to teach about deacons, and uh, because we need to install some deacons. You know, we have a lot of guys that we talk with and counsel with, but we need to kind of like put those things in place. It's about that time. Um, so I'm waiting for maybe by the time the summer is almost over and like the falls upon us and people are back from all their vacations, you know, we'll be able to start talking about that. So because you really help choose those deacons. That's something, nothing that I pick. You say, I think these people or this man or this men, the one or two or small, you know, that, that might be something you help with. And uh, I'm also thinking, I'm praying about maybe after I finish Thessalonians, maybe doing something on marriage and relationships. I'm thinking about just teaching a series on that. So I keep getting questions about that. And uh, my wife has a perfect marriage. I'm, you know, or I have a perfect marriage. My wife is just very patient. So, but anyway, John chapter 8. <clears throat> I find there's two types of people in the world. There are I love Lucy people and there are honeymooners people. And uh, I'm a honeymooners person. Those of you that are under 100, you know, honeymooners was a show that they used to play on television when there was antennas sticking out of the back of it. And um, I used to like the honeymooners. And in the honeymooners, Jackie Gleason's character, Ralph Cramden, used to rear back and exclaim a lot of things. But one of his famous lines was he'd kind of just shake his fist and he'd be like, one of these days, you are going to get yours. 
and he'd say that to his wife, or he'd say that to his best friend, and, you know, he didn't always mean it, but he kind of said, you know, one of these days there's going to be justice. One of these days things are going to be sorted out. One of these days something higher than me is going to level the field. And Gleason was joking, of course, as he was in character, but, but that thirst for justice, that desire to see wrong things made right, is very real, isn't it? To just kind of see something bigger than us and higher than us kind of make things right again. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a, a novelist who actually spent years in the communist gulags under communism, and he wrote this. He said, justice is conscience. Not a personal conscience, but the conscience of the whole of humanity, meaning people are waiting for justice, and people are waiting for righteousness. And as Christians, you can say amen whenever you want, but as Christians, we're longing, at least we should be, we're longing for the day when the righteous judge, Jesus Christ, will rule the world in righteousness. I'm waiting for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I like it so much, I have it on my mask. Right? I'm waiting for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to come back and just settle the score and make everything right, aren't you? I'm waiting for that day. And in John chapter 8, if you look at verse 51, there's this confrontation that Jesus Christ has been having with these religious idiots. And in John 8, 51, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? So as this confrontation reaches its climax, Jesus Christ's skeptics, you know what they do? They attack his identity. That's always what they went after, his identity. Who are you? And look how Jesus answers them. It's amazing. 54. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father, father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. Yikes. That's a burn right there. But I know him and keep his saying. Here's verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Jesus Christ counters his skeptics by pointing out that Abraham, the one that they said they were following, Abraham actually rejoiced to see his day. And these frauds, because that's who these religious idiots were, these frauds said they were Abraham's seed, but they didn't rejoice to see Jesus Christ's day like Abraham did. So I want you to think about something. Some of you are like, what are we talking about? Because I want to talk about what day is Jesus Christ talking about that Abraham saw and rejoiced to see? And why would Abraham rejoice to see this day? Because if you claim to be of faith like Father Abraham, you should rejoice to see Jesus Christ's day as well. You should. If not, you might be as much a fraud as these hypocrites if you're not rejoicing to see his day. So that's what I want to talk to you about today, rejoicing to see his day. What is that day that Abraham saw? What is that day that should make us rejoice? What is that day that's coming very soon? to a city near you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this word again, Lord. Thank you for this time. This is not a vain repetition, Lord. This is not a religious exercise, Lord. This is us asking you by your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and show us who you are and what we need to know from the pages of this book, Lord. I know to some of us it might seem spooky, Lord, to even speak to a God in heaven and ask him to give us illumination, Lord. But you said, call unto me and I will answer thee. And Lord, I'm asking you now, Lord, to do something with this message, Lord, as feeble and as weak as it is, and I am, Lord. I pray your Holy Spirit would show us Jesus Christ and illuminate us, Lord. Help us to get the right perspective and encourage your saints today and strengthen your flock. In Jesus' name, amen. So first I'd like to start with this. What day 
did Abraham rejoice to see? What made him so happy? What did he see with the eye of faith that filled him with gladness and should fill you with gladness as you look at it with the eye of faith as well? Look at 56 again. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Please notice that Jesus Christ said Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Not my birth, not my death, not my burial, not my resurrection. It wasn't Abraham seeing that Jesus Christ would die on the cross. Abraham didn't really understand that at all. None of the prophets of old really understood that at all. It was hidden. It was a mystery. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 2, we won't go there. But 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8, actually say that what Jesus Christ would do on the cross and all that it meant was a mystery. It was wisdom that was hidden. Because if the devil and all his minions knew what God would accomplish by putting Jesus Christ on the cross, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. It says the prophets of old scratched their head when they look into the scriptures to try to see the salvation we rejoice in. It wasn't clear. So Abraham wasn't looking at the incarnation. He wasn't looking at the gospel. He was looking at something very different. Go to Romans chapter 4. We'll start to unpack what did Abraham see. I'll give you the information and then I'll try to just give you some inspiration and some encouragement out of it. Romans chapter 4, please. Romans chapter 4 is speaking about Abraham. And if you're new to us, we look at a lot of Bible verses because what I say isn't really worth a wad of spit. Uh, but what the Bible says, don't be nervous. I'm not going to hit you. All right, but, but what, I, what God says is really what we try to be interested in here. So in Romans chapter 4, verse number 13, the Bible says, speaking about Abraham and the promise made to him, Abraham, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world, that was the promise, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You see, guys, the promise given to Abraham was that his seed would be the heir of the world. Heir means the successor, the inheritor of all things. The crown prince who is next in line to be king. And if you want to know who that seed is, go to Galatians chapter 3. I'll tell you who the Holy Spirit shows us that seed is. At least one reading of it. Galatians chapter 3. I know Israel was that seed, but there was someone else who was that seed that he's talking about here, that Paul's talking about here, that the Holy Spirit's talking about here. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 16, the Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, not a lot of different seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. So the Holy Spirit singles out, narrows down that that seed promised to Abraham who would rule the world is Jesus Christ. That's the seed. Now go to Genesis chapter 3. Go all the way back to the beginning of your Bible. Go to the third chapter. We're not even past three chapters in the Bible. And man has already screwed it up. Adam and Eve have eaten of that forbidden fruit and sin has entered into the world. And right now you see in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall, God gives us the first promise of a redeemer. I like how God doesn't waste any time. As soon as there's a problem, guys, in your life, God has always got the solution right there. And that solution is always somehow getting you to Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, you say, I don't even know what this guy up there with the wavy hands is even talking about. Guess what? The answer is Jesus Christ. You want to get to heaven? The answer is Jesus Christ. You want to be a better husband? The answer is Jesus Christ. You want to be a better wife? The answer is Jesus Christ. You want to know how to run your business properly? The answer is Jesus Christ. Everything in your life will be solved by getting in closer fellowship and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Genesis chapter 3, the fall has happened. Man is on the condemnation trail. And he says this, Genesis 3.15. God is speaking to the serpent. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed, because the devil has a seed, and her seed. Now, women don't have a seed, but she's going to get one. It, 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 not the woman, the seed. It, it, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
I want you to see that right after the fall, the Lord promised a supernatural a seed, a virgin birth, a seed that would come from a woman who doesn't have seed, but one woman would. And that seed would bruise the serpent's head, would bruise the devil's head. That did not get accomplished at the cross. You know what that will be accomplished? That is a prophecy of Jesus Christ coming back and crushing the Antichrist at the second advent. That's what it is right there. Right in the beginning of the Bible, God is saying, when this thing gets to the end devil, I'm going to crush your stinking head. I'm going to send my seed through a woman, and it's going to crush your head. He was promising the end from the beginning. That's how God works. Now go to Genesis 22. What does this have to do with Abraham? I'm trying to just lay some groundwork and then I'll get you hopefully shouting a little bit. Genesis 22. I don't want to be the only one shouting. Genesis 22. Now Genesis 22 is a very famous chapter where Abraham is about to offer up his son Isaac. It's a picture of the father sacrificing his son Jesus Christ. Isaac is a type of Christ, a picture of Christ. And the, and, and the Lord stops him. We know the story probably. Just nod your heads, maybe you know the story. And then God goes to speak into Abraham again. In verse 15, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord, that's an appearance of God, called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, because he could swear by no higher, saith the Lord, For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, watch 17 carefully, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Your seed, Abraham, is going to possess the enemy's gate. Now, in ancient times, the gate was a very special place. The gate was a place of access. The gate was a place of protection. But more importantly, the gate was a place of judgment. It was a place of dominion. It's where the elders would sit and rule over the city. And Abraham has promised, your seed is going to possess the gate of his enemies. And God is promising Abraham that his seed will one day rule the world and reign over his enemies. Aren't you looking forward to that day? That's the promise he's making. That's what I start to think Abraham rejoiced to see. Because in 18 it says, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. When that day comes, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And brethren, I think from the scriptures, that is the day Abraham rejoiced to see. Jesus Christ's day consistently in the scriptures is the day of the Lord. His day. The day of the Lord. The day that Jesus Christ's kingdom comes to planet Earth and a city near you. Now remember, 2 Peter 3.8. I'm not going to go there, but remember this verse. You've probably seen it. The Bible says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years. So that day that Abraham looked to, that day that we look to, that day that we're talking about when Jesus Christ's kingdom comes to earth, that day of the Lord is the 1,000-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ over the earth. The 1,000-year reign that we call the millennium, right? Mil means thousand. Anum means year. The 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ is God's day. Jesus Christ's day. The day of the Lord. Now, let me give you a little background. A lot of different people have different feelings about that day. You have people out there that call themselves Christians, and they are ah millennial. When you put ah in front of something, it means no. Like an atheist is somebody that says, no, I don't believe in God. Or you go back when life was normal, you went to an ah amusement park, 
Muse means to think, and amuse means not to think. You want to just pay your money, sit on a ride, and go bleh, and not think for an hour or two, right? That's what you go there for. They're not evil, but you go there not to think. Ah, muse. So there are people out there that are ah, millennial. They say there will be no righteous kingdom of a thousand years. It's all symbolic, and there's a lot of churches that think that. A lot of Orthodox churches think that. A lot of Protestant churches think that. That is the official position of the Roman Catholic Church. They say there is no thousand-year kingdom on earth. It's all symbolic. Then you have other people that are post-millennial. Right? Post means after. Right? And they think that Christ comes back at the end of our golden age. Now, we have to bring in the kingdom. We have to make the world a better place. We have to bring nirvana upon ourselves. And then at the end, Jesus is going to look over and say, okay, looks good enough. I can come down now. That's what John Calvin taught. That's what many reformers thought, that they had to bring in the world themselves. That's why John Calvin uh, executed people for sin and tried to bring in a nation state in Geneva, Switzerland, because he was trying to bring in the kingdom himself. But that's not what the Bible stand is. The Bible is clearly pre, meaning before, millennial. That Jesus Christ's return is pre-millennial, before the millennial happens. Because Jesus Christ is coming back before the millennium to set up his kingdom because he's the only one that can bring it in. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. I just want you to understand that that's the way different people see this. But the Bible is clearly, clearly, clearly pre-millennial. We can't set it up. We can't bring it in. Jesus Christ has to bring it in. Jesus Christ has to make it right. Jesus Christ has to come down and crush some things and possess the gate of his enemies and rule over the world in righteousness. And then, brother, we are going to see heaven on earth. It's coming to a city near you. Hebrews 11, I think that's what Abraham saw, verse 8. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, by faith, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he was going to a physical place, right? He, was going to, he wasn't going to heaven, he was going to a, a land. Obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. I think that was the day Abraham saw with the eye of faith. I think he was looking for the city of the great king. I think he was looking for that day when his seed would possess the gate of his enemies and rule the world in righteousness. When that promised seed would be the heir of the world and sit on a throne in Jerusalem. Can you picture that? When Lord, and think about, think about John chapter 8. Jesus Christ is in their midst 2,000 years ago. That kingdom was at hand. That blessing was right there. And they missed it. Because they missed him. And today, brother, sister, sir, ma'am, the blessing might be right there. And it's not in a political movement, and it's not in a political party, and it's not in, like, doing something social. It's not in cleaning yourself up. You know who the blessing always is? It's in God's seed. The blessing is always in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like Israel had all this promise right there at the gate, and they blew it, you and I could miss all that God has for us when we miss him. Just don't miss him. Just don't turn from him. Just don't run away from him. Can you go to Revelation chapter 11? Can I, guys, this day that we're talking about is closer than it was yesterday. And this day that we're talking about was a lot closer than it was seven months ago. My, how different the world was seven months ago. Right? The world was like, stock market was 30,000. Everybody was happy. Everybody could go where they want to go, do what they want to do. How a microbe changed the world. How a panic set. Think about the world, how different it is. I don't think we have 50 years. I don't think we have 100 years. We might, but I don't know. But the world is on an exponential graph now, man. You think, you ever see an exponent graph? It's not changing like this anymore. It's, you want to see a spike? Just look at the way the world is changing. That's a change, man. It's changing fast. 
It's changing fast. And in Revelation 11, this is the day we're looking for. When this whole thing is over in verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms, plural, of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus, of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the day we're looking for. We can see from this book that day is coming when Jesus Christ will possess the gate of his enemies, plural. And all those kingdoms become his, plural. And he rules and reigns in righteousness. Isn't that exciting to know that one day the wrongs are going to be made right? We could see that day approaching very quickly, and what a day that will be. It's going to be a day of rejoicing in the scriptures. It's going to be a day of gladness. You want to do a study? Chase, trace rejoicing and gladness and see how many times they're connected with Jesus Christ coming back. Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. So here's what I want to go. Go to Isaiah 2. That's a little groundwork, just what I think that day is from the scriptures. But now... I want to see why you should get excited about it. You okay? You want to get a little bit excited? You could shout, you could cry, you could just sit there and nod your head, whatever you want to do. But I want to encourage you today. I'm not going to really be preaching at you, just maybe a little bit at the end. But I want you to like see this. We need a heavenly perspective. We need the Lord. He told the Laodicean church, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. My eyes are messed up. I don't see things the way God wants me to see them. And in Isaiah chapter 2, I want to show you some things. There's many things we could say, but I'll just pick out a few. What was it about that day that made Abraham so glad? And why should you rejoice with Abraham? Why should you get happy? Why should you get excited? Why should you have a little bit of shouting and a little bit of faith as you see this day approaching? Isaiah chapter 2. Let me give you one reason that blesses my heart. Because in that day, the Lord is going to pull down all the pride of man that's been exalted against God. He's going to rip it all down, and he's going to humble everybody that has exalted himself against the God of heaven. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Amen. Verse 13, uh, verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the pleasant pictures. Can I tell you that in that day, he's going to pull down all that pride, all that ungodliness, all that hatred for your Savior, all that shaking its fist at God. Can I tell you, all that stuff's going to get squashed in that day. It'll all be made right. The right king will be on the right throne, ruling in righteousness. That's what's going to happen. You don't have to believe it, but that's what's going to happen. This Bible is the truth, and this Bible, just because I say it doesn't make it true, but if you search its claims and see its prophecies and see how it's predicted everything from the beginning to the ending, you will sit there and it should make you tremble. Amen. And it make you realize, like, wow, this is, this is what's happening. That's why it's removed from the public square. That's why they used to chain it to pulpits in the Dark Ages. They called it the Dark Ages, by the way, when you couldn't read the Bible for yourself. They don't want to use that anymore. They want to call it the Middle Ages. But back for many years when you were in school, you learned it as the Dark Ages because the light was hidden from people. And when the Renaissance came, which means new birth and new light, you know what ushered it in? The printing press. You know what they began to print? The Bible, the Word of God they began to print. And that began to go out through all the world. And science was rejuvenated. Schooling was rejuvenated. Societies were rejuvenated. The stranglehold of dead religion was loosening its grasp on the world. And we had a rebirth in the world and a renaissance in the world. And it affected everything. It was like those waters that are going to go out in the millennium and just began to heal the world. And it didn't stop because sinful man was there and, and the devil began to buttress it. But this book, whenever this light gets into something, 
it just blesses and it just helps and it just rejuvenates and just brings light. And I've had no idea where I was going with that. Oh, that's where the world, that's why the world wants to shut that Bible up. Get it out. Ban it. It's hate speech. Take it off the book list. Take it out of the schools. They used to read this book in the public schools in this country, maybe in some of your lifetimes. And you know what? They weren't shooting each other. And they weren't raping each other in the bathrooms. And that's the stuff that's going on today. You say, how do you know? Because I'm a public school teacher in New York. So I'm not speaking expositorily. I'm speaking anecdotally. I'm the ones that have the kids huddled under their desks in a lockdown and go, Mr. M, was it like this when you were a kid? And I have to look at them and say, no, man, I never had to do this. I never had to shut the lights, lock the door, hide in the corner, and just wait for somebody to knock and say, all clear, the lockdown has been lifted. I wish a pundit would connect the dots. I wish a pundit would say, everywhere the Bible is banned and taken out of the public square, the world goes to hell. Everywhere it seems to thrive and be, have free course, people are blessed by it. I wish somebody would just do some empirical, mathematical, scientific observation instead of shooting from the hip with their emotional bull. That was not in the notes. But you know what the world does? You know what the world does? You know what the world does? They, you guys, you know what? We need to be shaken up with that talk, though. Because we like live in this, we, you know what somebody called it, I read this week, it's like we live in the Borg. It's like we're in Star Trek and like we're fighting the Borg. And everybody, everybody's just joining the Borg. Like this mindless mess of just godless, depraved nonsense. And they just keep multiplying. And it's like, you feel like you're the only one with, like with any sense. But it's because you have light. And the world's in darkness. And I'm not hating. It breaks my heart. And you know what they, they, the people do? They boast about their science, falsely so-called, and they scorn you for not buying that you're a cosmic burp. You simple Christians think that God made everything. They belittle you for believing this book. They say you're narrow-minded when they're the most narrow-minded bigots around. You tell them something that questions their narrative, they almost have a heart attack and go on a smear campaign. Just a little Bible. They brag about their initiatives and their progress and they're going to bring in the world and make it a better place while our cities burn. Progress. <laughs> they band together as united nations to bring in peace without God and all they've brought in are endless wars. You know how many wars have happened since the United Nations began? that was going to bring in peace with their little Bible verse on the side of their building. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Neither shall any man learn war anymore. You know what I found out when I was in Haiti, and the, which was occupied by the UN? You know what Maurice LaPierre told me? That they were rioting against the UN because the UN peacekeepers were raping little boys. In the name of peace. <laughs> and you know what they do that drives me crazy? I'll just speak off the hip. You know what I do drives me crazy? They banish anyone with the audacity to speak against their godless agenda. Big tech has become big brother, friends. Big tech is big brother. There is no free speech anymore in truth. Big tech is big brother. But can I tell you, look at verse 17. I get excited. I get like Jackie Gleason. I say, man, one day you are going to get yours. Because in verse 17 it says, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. I'm looking forward to the day when all those haters who shove their fist shaking at God down your throat, one day they're going to bow. One day they're going to be put down. And you know what God's going to be? That's going to be the day that my king is going to be the only one that gets exalted. You know what, it's easy, it's easy. I can feel pretty big when I stand over a three-year-old and shout, I'm God. I get in front of somebody and say, I'm God. You could, teachers abuse the classroom like that. Teachers become demigods. Teachers are some of the weirdest people in the world. Rachel and I are an exception, all right? But teachers, <laughs> teachers can be some of the weirdest people on the face of the world. They get this God complex because they got all these little kids look up at them like this. And it's, it can feel pretty, I'm God, listen to what I say, because I said so. But how small your exclamation will sound 93 million miles away alongside the sun. You sit in a pound, you're just, I'm God, I'm God. You know how small that sounds, 93 million miles away next to the sun? It's just like, did somebody say something? You're God? What was that? 
your God? Isn't it funny? It's silly. Imagine putting a guy in front of the sun going, I'm God, in front of this massive nuclear explosion that's happening. I am God. Oh, really? As it melts the skin off your body. And you know one day how puny the pride of man will become when we finally see the sun who made the universe? The Son of God is going to come down, the one who made the sun, and people are going to be like, wait a second, he's God. Oops, <laughs> oops, he's God. Can you go to Isaiah chapter 13? I get excited. You should get excited too. I don't, have a, I don't have an ax to grind. I just see from the Bible that this is what the Lord is promising us and telling us. And I get excited because all the pride of man, all the foolishness of man, all this ungodly agenda, all this spiritual wickedness in high places, you know what time? Those high places are going to be made low. All the loftiness of man, all that stuff is going to be made low. And I'm looking forward to the day when my Lord alone is exalted in that day when the right king sits on the right throne and rules in righteousness. Hey, you know another thing in Isaiah 13 I see? I rejoice when that day comes because I rejoice to see that day because the world will finally see righteousness. Finally see somebody who does it right. Look at Isaiah 13, 6. How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isn't that exciting? That excites me. You know there's more of the Bible about that than there is about you getting saved. Two-thirds of the Bible is about that day. That is the climax of the whole Bible. The theme of the Bible is not your salvation. The theme of the Bible is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the biggest thing that's going to happen. That is the biggest show on earth. That is the climax of everything. And that's what's coming soon to a city near you. And the book of Amos, it speaks about it. And Amos says this in chapter 5, don't turn there. It says, let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Oh righteousness will be so refreshing literally and spiritually when that day comes that stream will literally go forth and spiritually it will bring righteousness to this earth jesus told people in the sermon on the mount when he was getting people ready for that day he said in matthew 5 6 blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled and man that filling is coming I look forward to the day when things will be made right, and one day it's going to be filled. It's going to be filled. That need is going to be met. That day's coming. Guys, haven't you had the growing ache that something is terribly wrong with the world? I mean, I'm not preaching. I'm just talking to you. I mean, haven't you had that sense that this is wrong? We are going the wrong way. That's wrong. That the whole direction is wrong. The whole direction is against God. Doesn't the new man inside of you long to see all this wrong be made right? I want to be in a place where I don't have to lock my door and worry about people walking near my kids. I want to be in a place where I don't have to cower six feet away from people and think about who's going to take advantage of me. I want to be in a place where there's righteousness and there's peace and the ruler is on the throne and I don't have to worry about him being on the take. I don't have to worry about him indebted to somebody in some special interest. I don't have to worry about if he's talking out of the other side of his mouth. We'll be a king over the earth in that day that'll say what he means and mean what he says and rule this thing the way it should be ruled. And that should make you rejoice. That should make you happy. You know, since the 1960s, there have been over 220,000 unsolved murders in this country alone. 220,000 people were murdered and nobody knows what happened to them. No justice. In 2018 alone, 
over 101,000 Americans were forcibly raped, and two-thirds of their attackers get off without any justice. That's a statistic. Doesn't that make something in you say, that's wrong, that's not right, that's wrong. And in 2019, according to the FBI, there were 421,394 NCIC entries for missing children. 421,000 entries about missing children in the God bless America? Those are the FBI stats, those aren't my stats. If you think we're going in the right direction, I would like to know what is in that bottle you just took from, because it's got you really doped up to what's really going on. Can you go to Jeremiah chapter 11? Doesn't that grieve you? Doesn't that sadden you? And you know what? It's not your neighbor that's doing this. Even your lost neighbor. It's not your lost neighbor. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. The common people heard Jesus Christ gladly. It was that small cabal at the top that was plotting and destroying. You know what, the, you know, saved or lost, you know what your average neighbor wants to do? They want to raise their kids, they want to go to the store, they want to just go to the movies, they want to just go about their life and just be left alone. I think, I think, I don't have any stats to back it up, I'm sure CNN will fact check me on this, but I think the average person just wants to make a living, raise their family, and be left alone. And there's this thing over us that is just like, you are going to do what I want you to do. And you just feel it. Don't you feel it? Like a serpent, just like twisting and perverting and changing the way people even think. The social engineering is brilliant. And in Jeremiah chapter 11, in verse number 19, Jeremiah was taking it on the chin from the wicked world he was in. They didn't want to hear the prophet. They didn't want to hear the preacher. And he says, but I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter. And I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, let us destroy the tree, meaning Jeremiah, with the fruit thereof, his preaching, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. Jeremiah's like, they want to kill me. They want to stamp out the truth. They don't want to hear what God says. You know what Jeremiah says in 20? You know what his prayer was? But O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins in the heart, Let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Not that you want to see anybody get hurt, but you just want to see justice. You just want to see God make things right. Lord, just make this right. I'm not doing wrong, and there's so much wrong, and I just want to see right. Go to Jeremiah 46. If the Holy Spirit's inside of you, there should be a desire for that day. There should be some joy in that day. I don't want it to come tomorrow because I've got unsaved family too. I've got lost family too. But deep down underneath all that, God is going to do what God is going to do. He's going to give everybody that opportunity. And some are going to say yes and some are going to say no. But I'm looking forward to Jesus Christ making it right. Because I'm getting a little sick of all the wrong. And in Jeremiah 46, verse number 9, you see that that day is a day when the Lord's going to settle the score. And all those sinners are going to get theirs. 46, 9, come up, ye horses, and rage. God's like taunting them, ye chariots. And let the mighty man come forth. Bring it. Bring it, he's saying. The Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. That's in the Bible. I didn't write that. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Can you go to Romans chapter 12, please? You know that day's coming, which means, guys... You don't need to get revenge. You don't need to settle the score yourself. You don't need to go pick it. You don't need to, you know, protest. You don't need to do any of that stuff. You don't need to, you know, get back at the person that wronged you. You don't need to do it. Commit it to God. Because the Lord says, look what he says in Romans 12, 19. This is to the church, Romans 12, 19. You see what he says here? He says, dearly beloved. That's not something you say at a funeral, right? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Put it aside for a little bit, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. And 
Not, not too much. Hebrews chapter 1. In case you were wondering, there's no need for revenge. You know what you just do? Rejoice. Because the righteous judge is just around the corner. He's just around the corner. He's probably getting his horse out of the stall and getting ready to mount up. And in Hebrews chapter 1, in case you're wondering, in case, in case you've made a God in your own image, second commandment, don't make a God in your own image. Because you know what? People have lied to you. People have told you they do one thing and did another. Some said till death do us part and they broke your heart. Some of them, you know, backstabbed you. Some of them betrayed you. All these things. And sometimes we make man, we make God in our own image. God, you might betray me. God, you might hurt me. God, you might not be faithful. In case you're wondering in Hebrews chapter 1, that kingdom that we're talking about is a righteous kingdom. Evildoers will not be tolerated. You know, you go into a store and there's a sign like you can't come in without a mask. Guess what? You're not going to enter into his kingdom evil or defiling or wicked. It says in Hebrews 1 verse 8, God is speaking to his son and he says, But unto the son he saith, Thy throne, O God, because Jesus is God, the Father said it right there, forever and ever a scepter, those are those things that kings would have, right? Those big like scepters, those metal staffs that were emblems of their authority. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. It's a righteous kingdom. Aren't you tired? Doesn't the hope of a righteous government make you rejoice and be glad like Abraham? <gasps> the idea of a righteous government coming to the earth. A righteous government. Aren't you tired of the empty political promises, the rhetoric, the divisive language, the inflammatory speech? Aren't you tired of the blatant hypocrisy of people doing things, you know, lockdowns for thee, but not for me? Right? You see it all over the place. I mean, just, that just hypocrisy, just doesn't it rub you the wrong way? The scandals? Who was on this island? Who was on that island? All these people that ended up being on Epstein's island, these people occupied the highest office in the land. Man, the tyrants, the cheating, the lies, the corruption of power drunken dictators. Aren't you just sick of it all? Tired of it. I'm not advocating overthrowing anything or else I wouldn't get my gun permit. But you know what? Go to Psalm 96. Just in your heart, you just got to be sick of the doublespeak. Sick of the serpent split tongue that says one thing and means another. Go to Psalm 96. I'm just trying to encourage you that we don't have much longer to wait. We don't have much longer to wait. We don't have to grieve. We don't have to be sorry. We don't have to pine away. You know what we have to do? We have to go forward. We have to just shoulder up. Whether it's five of us or 500 of us, we have to just shoulder up, love each other to death, love God to death, and... Let the Lord do that which is good. That's all. I say all these things to you. I'm not scared at all. Don't need to be nervous at all. Don't need to be afraid. Don't need to be pining away and biting your nails. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. The Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. And in Psalm 96, you see this promise of being rejoice, of rejoicing and gladness. Oh, worship the Lord, verse 9, Psalm 96, 9. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. That'll be true in the millennium. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Watch this. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Rejoice and be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. We are the trees of righteousness. We can rejoice now in spirit, but one day even nature is going to rejoice. Verse 13. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Go to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah 8. You know, man... You won't have to worry about mail-in voting in the millennium because the king is coming. There's going to be no election. It's going to be a theocracy. 
and the right man will be there. You know what it's going to be? Rejoicing and gladness. And you go to Zechariah chapter 8. Can I tell you when that day comes? When I tell you when that day comes, when Jesus Christ day comes, you know what it's going to be like? It's going to be like heaven on earth in his kingdom. In fact, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And when that kingdom comes down, it's going to be heavenly rule on planet earth. That was the disciples' prayer in that Jewish dispensation for a kingdom to come. And in Zechariah 8, you get a little glimpse of this. You get a little what the tone of this kingdom would be like. I like this passage. Again, the word of the Lord, verse 1, of hosts came to me saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion. Eli, can you picture that? You got Josh, you, you've been there, right? I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, mountains are kingdoms in the Bible, the holy mountain, watch this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever heard? Safe. Peace, righteousness. Your kids can run out of the house. You don't have to think twice about where they're going and who's nearby. Old men can walk in the streets and not get jumped by some hoodlum. Peace, a city of truth. You know, when I got that passage, you know that passage really spoke to me? I remember the Newtown shooting at Sandy Hook on December 14th, 2012, when a man, we can call him a man, he was a monster, named Adam Lanza killed 26 people, including 20 children. Most of them were six and seven years old. You know, I, was at, I came home from work that day, it was a Friday. And I remember I just broke down in tears in my kitchen because I felt so broken. I felt so hopeless. I felt so sick of this evil world. I kept thinking, what if I was there, hon? What if I was there? I had to do something, right? If I saw these kids getting gunned down by somebody, I'd have to do something. Wouldn't I? I'd have to charge them or do something. What would I do? I, I just felt so helpless in that moment, thinking about what would I do if I went to school where something like that happened. I'm in a school every day and just being so sick of what our kids in this world is like. And the next day, I had to preach a Christmas meeting at a nursing home. Fa la 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 la. Right? I had to go sing Christmas carols at Egger Nursing Home, and I had to go be a blessing to those people there. And the next morning, Zechariah 8 was in my reading. And I just spoke to these old folks about Zechariah 8. It wasn't a Christmas message, but I think it's what we wanted to hear. And in verse 6 is what really jumped out at me. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days... Should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? In other words, if you think it's beautiful, what do you think I think? That's God's heart. That's God's vision. That's what God has come in. God thought that up, not you. And even though my heart was heavy that day, I rejoiced to see that day. Even though my heart was heavy at that nursing home, I rejoiced to see that day when my king will make this world right. Go to Revelation 19. A few more verses. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Look at this. Here's the day. You want to see it? Here it is. Here it is. And then we'll wrap it up. He, Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. He is the climax of your whole Bible. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, there you are, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Doesn't that coming day when that seed will return to possess the gate of his enemies and rule in righteousness, doesn't that day make you want to rejoice? When Jesus Christ wins. When he finally 
wins. When, as the Bible says, when the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Because you're coming back with him. And right under your feet, you're going to see the Lord crush that serpent's head. And you, my brother, and you, my sister, are going to see the chief of all that devilment get his. And if you can't rejoice to see that day like Abraham, you know what I want you to do as we close here? Ask the Lord to give you a heavenly perspective. Go to Revelation 18, right across the page there. You know, here's Babylon, the chief city of this wicked world in Revelation 18. I'm not going to get into all that it means, but you know what? It's the greatest thing the world could produce is this Babylon system. You know what God's going to do? He's going to crush it. He's going to wreck it. You know what the world's going to do? The world's going to weep when it sees all its ungodliness turn to ash. It's right there. 1815. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. What a financial collapse. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as has trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven. And ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be, shall be that's not a guy that plays with popsicle sticks, that's a, that's a person that plays in witchcraft, shall be Hold no more at all in thee, uh, shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom, that's Jesus Christ, and of the bride, that's you, shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. There is the world weeping and wailing and oh! But you know what's going on in heaven? Look at the next verse of the next chapter. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. Would you add your voice to that? And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. <laughs> While the world is weeping over Babylon's evil embers, they are rejoicing in heaven. They are cheering, they are shouting, they are praising God. And if you can't, Maybe your heart has fallen too in love with the wicked world. That's the only thing I can see. You can go to 1 John, just a couple of stops left. Go to 1 John to the left a little bit. 1 John chapter 2. I said I'd get a little preaching in at the end. Because heaven is rejoicing when Babylon falls. Heaven is thrilled when they see that wicked, corrupt system finally dashed to pieces. How do I feel? How do you feel? If you're like, well, I kind of like it. That's a problem. Got to get your heavenly perspective back. And in 1 John 2.15, the Lord gives us a command here. You wouldn't kill somebody because the Bible says don't kill, but would you do this? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Lord commanded you not to love the evil system called the world. It's seductive. It's alluring. It's like a serpent's bite. It looks, you look into the eyes of the serpent, you're like, ooh, they're almost pretty. Reach your hand, and that viper lays hold, and it infects you with a philosophy and a thinking that is contrary to God and contrary to this book. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I got three stops left. Col uh, four. Colossians chapter 2. I'll make them fast. Colossians chapter 2. Want to see another warning? Colossians 2 verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you, plunder you, take your goods through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The Lord's warning us not to get too close to the world's thinking, because you get too close, the serpent's going to bite you. It's going to affect you. It's going to change the way you think about God, change the way you think about this book. You've got to wash your brain in the Word of God to get your thinking right. You know what James 4.4 4 says? It says, Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I didn't say it. God did. D.L. Moody, he was a preacher, he said it pretty well too. He said, if I walk with the world, I can't walk with God. So Christian, you're going to have to make a choice. Who you want to walk with. Who you want to fellowship with. Who you want to spend time with. Who you want to give your heart to. Because I'm going to tell you, it's kind of hard to fellowship with someone who's buddy-buddy with my son's murderer. All right, if somebody murdered my son, and you were friends with the person that murdered my son, I wouldn't be too friendly with you. You know what the world did? Lest you forget how wicked the world is, remember how it rejected your Savior. Remember how it put your Savior on a cross and rejects him to this day, and you want to get buddy-buddy with the one that killed your Christ. Whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Can you go to the last verses of the Bible, Revelation 22? The second to last verse of the Bible. You know what the last prayer in the Bible is? The Bible's full of prayers. You know what the last prayer in the Bible is? The last prayer in the Bible, you look at first mention, last mention, last mention's pretty instructive. The last prayer in the Bible is a plea for Jesus Christ to come. Yeah. Revelation 22, 20. Jesus is speaking to John. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Those was Jesus Christ's last words to John. You know what John ends? You know what John says? Amen. <laughs> Amen means, make it so, Lord. Even so, come. Lord Jesus. You know, I think John, John wanted to see that day. I think John wanted to see it. Do you want to see it? Go to Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Go to the last verse of the Song of Solomon. We've talked a lot about the Song of Solomon in here. Probably not enough. And the typology is right after Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is a beautiful picture of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful picture of the bride of Christ speaking to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, her beloved, and you're his beloved. And would you know what the last verse of that book is? It's almost like the last verse of the whole Bible, or the last prayer of the Bible. You know what her last request is? Look at it. She says, make haste, my beloved, and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. The next the last request of that bride is for her beloved bridegroom to come down. Come down from your mountain and come on down. And if you really love somebody, you know what you want to do? You want to see that someone do well, don't you? I want to see Jason have that shutout game. I mean, I know he always does. He has so many shutouts. He can barely, you know, I want to see my son, you know, drop 20, you know, drop 20 and 10 and do, you know, have a triple-double that he's going to have. Jesus is training him, right? You know, I want, to, I want to see somebody win the game. I want to see somebody win the fight. I want to see somebody, you know, win the case in court. If I, if I love somebody, I want to see them do well, shouldn't I? I want to see them overcome. I want to see them get the victory. And if you really love the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll rejoice to see his day. You'll rejoice to see him overcome and reign supreme. Because you love him. Let's finish in John 8. I just, we're done. John 8. I'm just going to go back to where we started and finish right there. John chapter 8. It'll be an interesting study 
to see how many times Israel as the seed and Jesus as the seed overlap. Because in John 8, 33, or a little earlier in our text, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed. Israel was Abraham's seed. They were supposed to be all that Jesus Christ had to be for the world. Israel was supposed to be the light of the nations. Israel was supposed to be the salt of the earth. Israel was supposed to let the world know who God was. But you know what happened? Verse 37. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Israel became corrupt and lost its savor as the salt of the earth. And Jesus Christ had to come down to restore all things and fix everything. And there he is, right there in the midst, to fix everything they messed up, to fix everything they broke. And in 856, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Hey, man, if they were the seed of Abraham, they should have rejoiced to see Jesus Christ's day. Because the king, the seed, had come. The promise was imminent. All those things that they wanted out of the Old Testament was right there at their fingertips. But they didn't want that. They wanted what they wanted. That's why Jesus Christ kept calling this crowd hypocrites. Because they weren't living what they professed. Oh, we're Abraham's seed. No, yeah, maybe in word. And let's turn it on ourselves as we close now. Are you rejoicing to see his day? You say, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm born again by faith. I'm following God. I love him. I want to see him. Are you rejoicing to see his day? Is your last prayer at the end of the night? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Because there's a crown for those that love his appearing. If you say one thing, but in your heart you're married to the world, that would make you a lot like this crowd, wouldn't it? A hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I know you'll want to be a hypocrite either. You wouldn't have sat here listening to me. So let's not be a hypocrite. Let's repent of whatever we got to repent over. And you know what? Let's rejoice. Let's get clean and let's rejoice and look forward to that day which is coming soon. Let's bow our heads. Bow our heads and close our eyes. Just have a word of prayer together. If you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, a lot of what I said today doesn't directly apply. I spoke mainly to Christians today, people that know the Lord. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you came with somebody, I would encourage you to ask the person that brought you or invited you and say, what's that all about? Or we have stuff on that back table about how to have eternal life. Or you could ask me at the end of the service, come on down and say, Pat, what's this mean about having eternal life? Or if you just want me to pray for you and say, Pat, I want to understand about eternal life. Would you pray for me? You can put your hand up, put it right back down. People aren't going to be looking around. No one's going to take your name and call you out. Just as an uplifted hand, say, Pat, I'd like to know more about having eternal life. Just here's my hand. Pray for me. Add me to that prayer. Amen? Anybody? Hey, Christians. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's ask the Lord to fix our vision. Anoint our eyes. Let us see things as they're supposed to be and get our perspective back so we're ready and we're rejoicing for that day. Father, we thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your kindness and we thank you for your love and we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your grace. And we just pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, that if anyone walks out lost, Father, I pray you'd Continue to strive with them, Lord, and show them the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior and the forgiver of their sins. And I pray, Lord, for every Christian here today, Lord. May they do business with you, Lord, because that day is fast approaching. And your coming is coming soon. And I want to rejoice to see that day. I want our people and your people to be ready for that day, Lord. I want to have my eyes on heaven, Lord, and just be looking unto you. And I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, you'd strengthen every saint in our assembly and our church family, Lord, that we'd be ready and rejoicing to see that day. And dismiss us now with your blessing and your care until we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I bless you, everybody. Have a great day, a great week, and Lord willing, we'll see you soon. All the stuff that's happening will happen this week.